Hi everybody and welcome back to another episode of Discard Dead where we like to open boosters and boxes of dead and out of print trading card games. This episode marks a new addition to our viewing lineup where I will try to explain how any of these dead card games are played. If you've seen any of my deck videos that's great and thanks for watching. You'll likely have picked up on my suggestion to keep an eye out for these so here we are. Today's video is about Jihad and Vampire the Eternal Struggle. The game was originally designed by Richard Garfield, the creator of Magic the Gathering, as well as a whole slew of others, and this game is part of the original Deckmaster series, along with Battletech and Netrunner, two other deceased card games. For the sake of brevity, from here on I'll be referring to the game as Vampire, and it is a game that pits two or more Methuselahs against each other, ancient vampires executing their centuries worth of planning and enforcing their will on both practical and political landscapes. Let's have a look. The first part of any customizable card game is, of course, the cards, and the kind of deck you build with them. Let's talk about the two parts to your game, the kinds of cards you may come across, and how to use them. First off, we have the Crypt. The Crypt contains the vampires you'll want to recruit to carry out your plans. Each has a variety of details to help you understand what they are and what they can do. Firstly, you'll find their name and what they look like, some entrancingly beautiful, others horrifyingly bestial. This is Kathy Glenn's. Here we have your vampires clan. Each is an ancient lineage of vampires who share common traits, pass through blood, and all vampires belong to one or another. We can see here that Kathy is a Toreador. Vampires also have access to a selection of disciplines, which are different ways a vampire can utilize their blood to harness a variety of effects. A square discipline icon means the vampire has the basic ability in their power, while a diamond icon means they have superior command. Some cards have different effects available depending on a vampire's level in that discipline and may choose which effect to use. Here we see that Kathy can use cards that require at least basic aspects, celerity and thaumaturgy, as well as basic or superior presence, a mainstay discipline of powerful Toreador vampires. Each vampire has a text box that may or may not have any special titles or abilities printed there as well as their blood capacity, which is both a measure of how old and powerful they are, as well as how much of your pool must be invested to control them, but more on that later. Kathy here belongs to the Camarilla, a sect of vampires that prefer to maintain the traditions of secrecy and protection of vampires and mortals from each other, and has a blood pool of six. A few extra notes on vampires though. Some vampires are referred to as anti-tribute of their clan, and are identified by a red circular shield behind their clan icon, meaning that they are in some way opposed to some aspect of their original clan, Venture and Venture Anti Tribute, for example. In game purposes, they are treated mechanically as different clans, so cards that refer to or require use by a Venture Anti Tribute cannot be used by a regular Venture and vice versa. Additionally, some cards will also have the words Camarilla, Sabbat, or Anarch denoting them from different sects of vampire society. While there is no specific rule that prevents you from mixing characters from different sects, characters with different titles for the same city, however, be it Prince, Cardinal, or Baron, will be considered contested for that title. Lastly, above the text box, you'll find the card's group number. When selecting vampires for your crypt, you may only select vampires of a singular group or from two consecutive groups. If you want to include Kathy here in your deck, you'll need to fill the crypt out with other 6s and either 5s or 7s. The Library This is where everything else goes, from the actions your minions take and the blessings and tools you bestow upon them, to the places where you take advantage from, and even your own direct actions as the master of your domain. There are lots of card types that can go into a library, and most require you to have ready minions in play. It is not necessary to include each kind of card in your library, and depending on the theme or idea of your deck, you may very well only use specific cards from only three or four types. With the exception of master cards, it is important to understand that it is not you using these cards, but your minions. Let's have a look at them. Action cards. These are special orders or actions a minion could take outside of the basic actions normally available to them. Some can replicate the effects of basic actions at a higher effect or efficiency, while others can do something different altogether. Action Modifiers 
When a minion takes an action or uses an action card, these can be played to alter the effects in some way before it is resolved. Reactions When an opponent's minion takes an action, these can be played in response to it, either to reduce the effect, cancel it, or something else entirely. Equipment These are the weapons and tools that can be used by a minion. When played, they are attached to the particular minion you control and are usually burned along with them should they perish. Allies The non-vampires that can be persuaded to aid you. Mortals, zombies, demons, and even werewolves and changelings may strike up a bargain. Allies are minions that have their own life points which are taken from the bank, as well as strength and bleed values, and can act independently of the acting vampire who brought them on. Retainers these are the servants of your servants. They are attached to the acting minion, which becomes the employing minion in this instant, and similarly to equipment to provide them with some bonus. Like allies, they take their starting life from the bank, but unlike them, they cannot act independently. Political actions. They represent the interactions between various pockets of vampire society, and the responses to events or times of discussion when decisions must be made. These cards can be played for their desired effect, but must be voted on by all players. If a vote has already been called, however, these can be discarded for however many votes are listed on the card. Combat cards. These can be techniques and talents, or just whatever is lying around and are used by a minion in combat. Master cards. Now, where your minions are the ones using action cards and so forth, you yourself are using master cards. And there are two types of these regular and out of turn. During your master phase, a single master card can be played as your action during your turn. While it is not your turn, however, you can play a single out of turn card. If you do so, you will give up the right to play a master card during your next turn, as you wouldn't want to overextend. Among the regular master cards are locations, trifles, trophies and disciplines. The locations are places and spaces that you control, where your influence spreads, granting you boons to minions. These can be used repeatedly until burned, and some of them require a vampire of a particular clan to be in play. Trifles are small matters that require little attention and effort. A single trifle may be played without expending your master phase action, allowing you to play one additional master card. Likewise, playing an out-of-turn trifle does not disallow you from playing a master card during your next turn. A subsequent trifle, however, does not grant an additional master phase action and will act as a regular master card. That being said, an out-of-turn out trifle will not allow you to play an additional out-of-turn master card. Trophies are special cards that don't have any effects until they are attached to a minion, which will grant them special benefits for a small period of time. Disciplines are cards that can be attached to enhance any vampire minion you control by giving it access to either a new discipline power, expanding the cards of they can use, or advancing the basic form to a superior form. In addition, they will also increase a vampire's blood pool by one. Now that we've had a look at the different card types, let's see how we can use them to build a deck in two different ways. If you start out with your crypt, you might choose vampires from one or two clans with common disciplines. Toridor's Adventurers both can access Dominate and Presence, for example. The cards you pick then may depend on their printed abilities, or even just which artworks you like the best. Keep in mind that your crypt must contain at least 12 vampires, but not necessarily all different cards. You might give extra copies of some, in case one prematurely perishes. Alternatively, you could build your library first. You might want to pick a theme, like using a lot of bleed action and stealth modifier cards to swoop in and burn your opponent's resources or perhaps equipping your vampires with powerful long-range weapons and focus on combat maneuvers to maximize attack and survivability. Maybe you want a lot of political power. You might choose vampires with titles to capitalize on voting ability. Whatever you want to do, there are plenty of minions to help you seal the deal. Finally, while there are no major restrictions in regards to how many of a particular card can be in your library, there are some library size limits. In old Jihad rules, a library could be from 40 up to an additional 10 cards per player. In Vampire the Eternal Struggle, a library can have between 60 and 90 cards. There are a few important steps that must be taken before this game of Shadows can commence. 
Firstly, you need to know who is where. Unlike a lot of other card games, the order in which you play is, can be incredibly important, as the player to your left is considered your prey, the player to your right, your predator. This becomes more important depending on the number of people playing, however, as temporary alliances can be made with four or more players, while the degree of intrigue or actual gameplay politics diminishes with three or less. As you begin setting up your play area, it's important to know where everything goes as well. First of all, shuffle up your two decks, the crypt and the library, separately. The shuffled crypt is placed on the left in front of you, and the shuffled library behind that, as shown in our diagram here. Next to the crypt, is the uncontrolled area, and above it, next to the library, is the ready area, where active vampires are free to act as necessary. In this pocket here, between the uncontrolled and ready areas, is the torpor area, where wounded vampires are placed, and finally, the ash heap, where cards that are burned or discarded are placed. Next comes the pool, which we've mentioned a few times before. Your pool of blood tokens is a direct representation of your power and resources and is used in a variety of ways. First and foremost, to quantify it in similar game terms, it is a measure of how much life you have. You may spend it when using certain action cards, or during the influence phase when recruiting new minions, and you lose pool when a minion of the opposition successfully bleeds you. You begin the game with 30 pool, as well as an extra 10 from each player placed in the communal bank, where blood is taken from whenever a vampire hunts or if you have the edge. Should you run out of pool, you are removed from the game. The bank is a communal collection of tokens that are taken from when a vampire successfully hunts or when attached to an ally or retainer card when you play them. Whenever a vampire takes damage from combat or spends blood for abilities, and when you as a Methuselah spend pool to play cards, these tokens are stashed in the bank. It is important to note that the bank can never truly run out, even if there aren't any tokens left. Should you run out of tokens, just find something else to substitute them. The edge is a small symbol representing some advantage you have over the other Methuselahs and begins the game uncontrolled and placed in the central area along with the bank. Any small trinket can represent the edge, be it a coin, miniature, glove, etc. Finally, take the top four cards from your crypt and place them face down in your uncontrolled region and then from your library, draw a starting hand of seven cards and you are ready to rise into the night. Before moving on, Unlike other card games, the lines between winning and losing are blurred. A Methuselah will receive one victory point when their prey leaves the game, at which point the next player on your left becomes your new prey. Additionally, being the last one standing will yield you another victory point. Even if you run out of pool, if you have more victory points at the end of the game, you'll be the victor. Alternatively, even if you are the last surviving player, you may not win if an opponent has more victory points than you. Now that we've had a look at the cards and the setup process, it's time to go over the phases of a turn. These are the individual steps you need to complete in order before your turn ends. The unlock phase. The first thing you need to do is unlock any locked minions. A minion may become locked as a result of a card effect or after attempting an action, and while locked they may not perform any other actions. If you come across any older cards, particularly from Jihad, that reference tap or untap, these terms have been replaced in modern editions with lock and unlock. Afterwards, if you have the edge, you may take a blood token from the bank. <clears throat> the master phase. This is the time for you to play your master cards, only one during the phase, as previously mentioned. If you have not played an out of turn master card before the beginning of your turn, you are free to play one, should you have one in your hand. Minion phase. This is the main event where most of the game's action takes place. There is a lot that can happen here, so we're just going to skip it for now and look at it in more detail a little later. The Influence Phase During this phase, you can utilize your blood to recruit vampires to join you. You have up to four transfers to use at this time. You can use a transfer to move one pool to a face-down vampire in your uncontrolled region, two transfers to take a blood token from a face-down vampire, and four transfers and burning a pool, which is to move it to the bank, to take the top card of your crypt and place it face down in your uncontrolled region. When a face down vampire has as many blood tokens on it equal to its blood capacity, flip it face up and place it in your ready area. 
the discard phase. In the final phase of your turn, you can choose up to one card in your hand to discard, and then draw a new card. Then it is the end of your turn, and player moves to the person on your left. Before we go into the minion phase, it is important to know that every time a card is played, another card is drawn to replace it, so that you always have seven cards in your hand. The only time you wouldn't draw to replace is if the card that you played specifically states that it isn't replaced until combat or the major action is resolved. The minion phase is where your minions can act and only unlocked minions in the ready area can do so. Attempting an action causes a minion to lock as well as any minion who blocks an acting minion. Each action must be resolved before another action can take place. Further, until an action is resolved, action modifiers and reaction cards may be played in this time to alter the effects or success of the action. A ready vampire may take one of the two basic actions during the turn, to bleed or hunt, whereas a ready ally may only perform one basic action which does not require the play of an action card, to bleed. Instead of making any basic action, a ready minion can play an action card. Some have advanced, advanced versions of the bleed or hunt actions, while others have original kinds of effects altogether. The actions described henceforth are either directed or undirected, depending on their targets. Should an action card's text box include the D icon, then it would be considered a directed action. If an action targets one or more other Methuselahs, or things controlled by other Methuselahs, it is considered a direct action and may be blocked by a ready unlocked minion that Methuselah controls. If the action does not target one or more Methuselahs, or something they control, it is considered undirected, and may be blocked by either the acting Methuselah's prey or predator with the prey having the first opportunity. An action's success depends on the stealth of the acting minion, and an opposing minion's ability to intersect. Stealth represents the acting minion's measures in conducting their business while being undetected. An opponent's ability to intercept represents efforts in detecting and countering the minion's attempts to avoid them. Here is a list of the types of actions a minion can take during your turn. The minion who is making an action, be it with or without a card, is referred to as the acting minion. Now this is important. Some action cards may require a minion to have access to certain disciplines and cannot be used otherwise. Additionally, the number of action cards have different effects depending on the level of discipline the acting minion can access. Bleed. This represents the efforts of a minion to undermine the power of a target Methuselah. This could be paying bribes, changing bank records, spreading rumors, and so on. Bleeding can be performed as a basic action or may be performed by an action card. While making a bleed action, only one action modifier can increase the amount an opponent is bled by, and any amount of pool that is bled is returned to the bank. A, a default basic bleed is for one pool. Should a bleed action be successful, the owner of the acting minion gains the edge, taking it from any Methuselah who holds it, if any. Hunt. Should a vampire be left bereft of blood, they only have one course of action, and that is to hunt. That is, to take a blood token from the bank for themselves. It is performed with a plus one to stealth, it is an undirected action, and they take blood tokens equal to their hunt value, being one by default. Should a vampire ever be in excess of their blood capacity, any more than their score is immediately returned to the bank. Just as a bottle can hold so much, so too can a vampire. Leaving Torpor If a vampire is in Torpor for whatever reason, the vampire can spend two blood tokens as an action and plus one stealth, and move from the Torpor region to the ready region. If the action is blocked by another vampire, that vampire has the opportunity to diablerize the acting vampire. A vampire that has no blood cannot leave torpor by themselves and must be rescued by another vampire. Torpor is a condition that occurs when a vampire sustains an amount of damage that leaves them wounded. A vampire may become wounded if they take regular damage more than they would have blood tokens left, or if they take aggravated damage. If a vampire takes regular damage, they must mend themselves by burning one blood token per point of damage, and then if there is no more blood but there is still damage, they will go into torpor. If a vampire is wounded and takes aggravated damage again, they must burn blood 
For each point, if there is still any aggravated damage left, the vampire is burnt and sent to the ash heap. Employer Retainer. A minion may garner the services of a retainer by playing a retainer action card and attaching it to the acting minion. They provide special abilities to the employing minion and there is no limit to how many retainers a minion can have. The employing minion plays a re retainer action card at plus one stealth and when it comes into play, takes an amount of life counters from the bank equal to its printed life score. When this life is depleted, the retainer is burnt. Equip Minion As an action at plus one stealth, the acting vampire may have an equipment action card placed on them to grant them a special ability, quality, or in some other way enhance them in a combat situation, whether by increasing the damage they deal or giving bonuses to their stealth, and so on. Recruit Ally Recruiting an ally is similar to employing a retainer, in that a ready minion must use the action to bring it into play. It is done at plus one stealth, and life counters are taken from the bank to attach to the ally. The major difference is that it is considered to be another minion, and not attached to the employing minion. It can act independently by itself, and when it loses its last life counter, it is burnt. Political Action A vampire may call a referendum by using a political action card as an undirected action at plus one stealth. If successful, the terms are chosen and votes are cast to see if it passes or fails, for or against. The specific terms of the referendum are not chosen until the action itself is successful. After it is successful, the costs, if any, are paid and the referendum is called over three steps. First, the terms are chosen. Second, before votes are cast, action cards may be used by ready and unlocked minions. Third and finally, if there are more votes for the referendum, it passes. Less, or in the case of a draw, it fails. Votes can be gained as follows. The Methuselah who played the political action card to start the referendum gains a vote. A Methuselah may burn a single political action card from their hand for an additional vote. A Methuselah gains additional votes further for each ready and unlocked titled minion as follows. A Primogen gains one additional vote. Princes or Barons grant two. A Justicar grants three and an Inner Circle member grants four. Other minions that do not have titles might have additional votes if it is printed on their card. Finally, a Methuselah who controls the edge may burn it to gain an additional vote. The edge is then returned to the central area. Encounter a Vampire in Torpor A vampire may rescue another vampire in Torpor if they spend two blood tokens. If successful, the rescued vampire can move from its controller's torpor region to the ready region. Likewise, a vampire may instead diabolize the vampire in torpor, which requires no blood, but comes with its own condition. If either of these actions are made against a vampire you also control, it is made a plus one stealth, and is not considered a direct action. If it is made to target another Methuselah's vampire in torpor, it is made at the default zero stealth, and is considered a directed action. If a vampire successfully commits Diablerie of another vampire, all blood is moved to the Diablerist with any excess burnt. They may take any of the victim's equipment and the victim is burnt. Any other cards attached to them are also burnt. Finally, a blood hunt is immediately called. Methuselahs are called to referendum as if a political action card were played, except that if it is passed, the Diablerist is burnt along with all of their attachments. Here we'll go over the steps that minions must take when performing actions. We've, co we've covered a bit of this in previous sections, but now we'll go into it in a little more detail. Before a minion can act, the Methuselah that controls them must announce the action that minion is taking, who is then locked. If the action targets another Methuselah or a minion they control, it is a directed action, and the target must choose a ready minion of their own to block. If the action does not target another Methuselah or one of their minions, the action may be blocked by either the prey or predator, with the prey getting the chance to block first. If the minion is using an action card that requires a discipline, that minion must have access to that discipline or it cannot be played. 
Unless they are either performing a special action, using a particular action card, or if they have a printed ability, a minion's default stealth is zero, as is their intercept. As such, and unless any abilities or cards are used to increase the acting minion's stealth, the block attempt will succeed, as the intercept of the opposing minion will at least match the acting minion's stealth. As mentioned previously, some actions have an inherent plus one bonus to stealth, such as hunting, employing minions, recruiting retainers, equipping items, leaving or encountering a minion you control in torpor, as well as political actions. Should an attempt to block the acting minion fail, as in the blocker's intercept falls below the stealth, another attempt to block may be made by another minion. After the action is announced and before the action is resolved, the acting minion has the opportunity to play action modifier cards first, before any other Methuselahs try to use reactions. Any modifiers and reactions played to increase stealth or intercept can only be played if needed, that is, as long as the intercept or stealth beats the other, any cards to increase it further still cannot be played. If the attempt to block is unsuccessful, and no other attempts are made to, the action succeeds. Any necessary costs are spent, the card's text is resolved, and the card is burnt. If the block was successful, however, no costs are spent, but the card is still burned, and then we jump into combat, as two operatives from opposing forces clash. Keep in mind that as the results of modifier and reaction cards are resolved as they are played, and so their costs are paid as you play them. Okay, here's an example of how an action might go. Kathy is going to use the action card Legal Manipulations, which is a bleed action card that targets another Methuselah. She selects the advanced version since she has superior presence and then blocks. That Methuselah decides to block with the minion of theirs, the vampire Gilbert Duane, who is equipped with a 44 Magnum. Both Kathy's stealth and Duane's intercept is zero, so now Kathy spends three blood to play the action modifier Virtuosa, which increases Kathy's stealth by plus one. Duane has no reaction cards to play, and since there are no other minions to block her, the action succeeds. Kathy spends the single blood cost for legal manipulations and bleeds the Methuselah for three. Kathy's default one and the plus two for her action card, as well as taking a pool from the bank for her master. The minion phase then continues. When two vampires meet as a result of a successful defense, combat ensues. Before minions can attack each other, you must determine whether combat is fought at close or long range. Combat is by default fought at close range, where melee weapons and hand strikes can be used. Some cards or effects can be played before combat range is decided and will be clearly stated on those cards. Some of these cards can be used to maneuver and change the range of combat from close to long. A minion may want to change the range depending on the kind of weapon equipment they have. If a minion plays a maneuver to change the range of combat, the opposing minion may also play a maneuver to return combat to its original range. After range has been determined, Minions can get up close and personal, playing strike cards to either deal damage or to avoid being struck. Even cards that allow a minion to dodge or evade are considered strikes. Damage from strikes may be enhanced by weapon cards or printed abilities, and each minion only gets one strike per round. A strike from each minion is considered a pair. There are two parts to resolving damage, which will occur after successful weapon strikes. Preventing and mending damage. Firstly, the minion taking damage can play combat cards that can prevent damage one at a time until all damage is prevented or they decide not to or they can't play anymore. Any damage that is not prevented is inflicted. Any damage sustained by a vampire is mended by burning blood, one token per point of damage. Likewise, any ally or retainer that takes any damage burns life counters for each point. If a vampire takes more damage than they have blood, they burn all their blood and become wounded, going into torpor. Some damage is considered environmental damage and has no source and cannot be dodged, since dodging only protects from the opponent's strike. Some damage is described as aggravated damage, such as injury from sunlight, a supernatural creature's claws and fangs or so on. A vampire that sustains aggravated damage immediately goes into torpor and burns blood to prevent their destruction. If a vampire that takes aggravated damage does not have enough blood to save them, they are destroyed. After combat is resolved, 
and both have survived, a minion may wish to continue combat for another round by playing a card that says press. The opposing minion may also play a press to cancel the first one played. If it is not cancelled this way, another round of combat ensues and the previous steps are repeated until that one and two is resolved. After all combat has been resolved, the combat round ends and gameplay returns to the minion phase. Let's have a look at a combat example. Let's go back to Kathy's action from earlier. Say for example, Dwayne has played a card to increase his intercept, such as Spirit's Touch, a reaction card that gives plus one intercept. Kathy would have been blocked, resulting in a combat round, which would allow Dwayne an optional combat maneuver. Dwayne chooses to go to long range. Kathy has no maneuvers to play, and neither have any other cards to play during combat, so Dwayne inflicts two range damage to Kathy, who deals no damage to Dwayne. Kathy burns two blood, leaving her wounded. She is moved to the torpor area, and the minion phase continues. Hey everyone, well, hopefully by the time we've finished this video, you've learned how to play Vampire. If you haven't seen, each section is timestamped to allow easy backtracking, so you can go back over anything you may have forgotten. In the description below, you'll find a bunch of links to the Jihad deck I just opened recently, a box of Swords of Cain from a while back, and the Black Shantry website, where the most recent rulebook can be downloaded and new decks and box sets can be purchased. Thanks for watching. This one took a little while to do, I got a lot of dry mouth and uh, had to record it in pieces. Uh, consider subscribing and liking this video or any others that you've seen and enjoyed. And with that, happy hunting.